Hello, and welcome to the National Archives Foundation's virtual program series. I'm Patrick Mann, the Executive Director of the National Archives Foundation. Thanks for joining me. Through this programming, we're delighted to open the virtual doors of the National Archives, its billions of treasures, to study our nation's past. This is a special edition because we're featuring one of our Cokie Roberts Research Fellows. The Cokie Roberts Research Fund the Women's History supports annual fellowship for emerging and established historians, journalists, authors, and graduate students who perform and publish new research for the general public to elevate women's history using the records of the National Archives. Recipients of the fellowship will perform research at the National Archives on Women's History for a published book, article, essay, film, short series, or art piece. If you'd like to learn more about the fund or our former fellows, please visit archivesfoundation.org. While you're there, if you're so inspired, feel free to support the fund with a donation. Our moderator today is Rebecca Boggs Robert. She's an award-winning writer and educator. She's the author of four books. She's currently the Deputy Director of Events at the Library of Congress and serves as one of my bosses on the board of the National Archives Foundation. She has served on board of directors or advisory boards for a number of prestigious historical organizations. Dr. Lois Levine is the 2021 recipient of the Cokie Roberts Fellowship for Women's History, supporting her research of Civil War espionage and the postbellum activism of Mary Jane Richards Dennis. Dr. Levine is the award-winning author who's earned degrees in history and literature from Harvard, University of Southern California, and UCLA. She's currently the Director of Public Relations at Lewis and Clark College. And to learn more about her research, please do work, uh, welcome Rebecca Roberts to lead today's conversation. Lois Levine, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. This research is so thrilling to me, and I'm, I'm delighted to talk about it. Just briefly recap your research for us. Where are you and what are you looking into? Right. So I came to this project in a really odd way. Um, there's a woman who's best remembered as Mary Bowser and credited with spying for the Union during the Civil War by posing as a slave in the Confederate White House. And when I first read about her, which was a long time ago when I was in graduate school, um, I thought, wow, that's so interesting. And I ended up writing a novel about her uh, called The Secrets of Mary Bowser. So I imagined her life. And I imagined her life because at that time, it seemed that there wasn't enough material to write a biography of her. And then a few years ago, I came across a document that um, a letter that she had written after the Civil War to the woman who had been her enslaver, but also worked with her in the spy ring. And it included just enough tantalizing biographical details that I thought, wow, I could really start researching a biography. So I am now writing a biography of the woman we misremember as Mary Bowser. Um, like many women, she took on and put off names as she acquired and discarded husbands, but also like many um, newly emancipated African-Americans, self-naming was a really important process for her. And so it's tricky as a historian, you want to land on a name, but you also want to respect the choices of this person, which was that um, the different names that she used at different points in her life really were so important to her. So sometimes I just call her Mary. Sounds disrespectful. But you know, if Beyonce can be Beyonce with just one name. <laughs> right. Madonna. I mean her, I mean her nothing but the most respect. She was an amazing activist. And I think that's part of what's compelling about this project. She she was never actually a spy in the Confederate White House. She attempted to infiltrate it. It was not successful. She did uh, she did work as part of uh, an interracial aspiring in the Confederate capital during the Civil War. So that was definitely important. But she was an activist before and after the Civil War as well. And so thinking about her and her relationship to other African-American activists and what it meant specifically, she was female as well as Black and also really young as all of this was happening. So um, a really exciting way to approach documents that generally were not meant to uh, convey the points of view of young Black females. And that was part of the challenge and excitement of being at the National Archives. Young Black females who were secretive, right? You've got a whole other layer of difficulty in parsing out a story that 
the subject didn't want to be told. Yeah, and that that is one of the things I think about a lot as historians. We want to find examples of resistance. What are the ways that people were resisting oppression in the past? But often if that resistance was the most successful, it left the least amount of documentation for us to find. <laughs> so sometimes you have to say, I mean, there were many times when I was in, at the National Archives where I would think, okay, this is where I'm finally gonna find this thing. Like I know I'm, it's leading up, it's leading up. And then like literally the pages would be torn out of the 19th century records. And in some ways it's a total heartbreak. And in some ways it's like, ah, okay. I just have to respect that we can't always find what we're looking for. And when you do archival research in the era of the internet, like the internet and now chatbots have taught us like, you just pose a question and the answers will come flying your way. And that's not how historical research works. And anybody who's been in an archive knows that um, sometimes you can't find what you think you're very much looking for. And sometimes your greatest find is something that you didn't know you were looking for. <gasps> Wait, what? what? Look at this letter. I just never expected it. Um, so you have to love the hunt <laughs> as, as well as the outcome. Have you had that moments of finding unexpected treasures? Yeah, uh, often. Um, and I think in particular, my project is a biography, but in some ways I don't think about, biography is traditionally like one person's remarkable story of their extraordinary deeds. And I, and I think that approaching this project as a feminist and also thinking about African-American community. I don't want to just like, we used to have the one great man story and that's just substituting in a woman and particularly a woman of color. It raises up new people's stories for us, but I think it also misrepresents as biography often does the idea that like one person affected all this change by themselves. So often what's really interesting to me is the layering of, wait, I know that Mary was in this place at this time interacting with these people. And then I find these people over here interacting with these other people and sort of figuring out the network of activism, the networks specifically during the Civil War through which African-Americans free and enslaved civilian and in the military, female definitely, as well as men and children, as well as adults, were helping to undermine the Confederacy. That's really powerful. And then the National Archives records also allowed me to see a lot of what was happening during Reconstruction, the period immediately after the Civil War, when she was definitely involved with activism in a number of Southern states where she lived and worked. So many moments of like, wait, oh, I see. And, um, and just sort of mapping out maybe instead of a trajectory, which is how we think of biography, it's more a constellation, which is to say all of these connections of different figures and forces. Do you think that recognition that history or social change is made collectively and um, with interrelationships is, um, does that have a female bent? I mean, you said the one great man story, right? Is this a, a different way of looking at how history gets made through a female lens? I think so. And I, I think it is easy for us to fall into the, you know, one great story. Uh, and again, just want to sub in. And my first book about this person was a novel and a novel generally follows one person's trajectory. Although I included even in that work of fiction, many um, African-American activists they were maybe not the ones that she actually interacted with in real life, as I'm finding more documentation of that. But I do think in terms of what it means to do a feminist history, that really thinking about collectivity and collaboration and community gives us a better way to understand how things, how change has actually happened. Um, and that, you know, even if you think about figures like Martin Luther King Jr., who of course is a remarkable figure, but there was a broad network of people who were supporting the civil rights movement and often putting themselves out front. Many of the ones who are women, we don't know as well, but we should because they were just as vital to the movement. And I think even more so in the 19th century when simply speaking in public as a woman was considered 
at best risky and uh, often just flat out wrong. And so what did it mean for women to put themselves out there as activists? Uh, Mary did speak at public political meetings. She also was not shy uh, in her correspondence in confronting either military leaders or uh, elected politicians and basically saying, this terribly wrong thing is happening. And I'm sure you will be as horrified as I am by this terribly wrong thing. So I look forward to acting to undo this terribly wrong thing that is happening. And I think that she understood that making her case as a woman, as a civilian, as a black person, that all of these men who were in, white men who were in positions of authority had every reason not to listen to her. And part of what I love is finding the documentation either directly from her, right? The rhetoric in which she says, you better do something or there's gonna be a riot in this town, right? That, and by riot, she means uh, white supremacist violence. And then like over here in this other, totally other place and thank you National Archives, I find information that suddenly they moved troops into the area, and this is after the Civil War had ended, into the area that she was writing about, and lo and behold, there was no race riot. Mm -hmm. So it's also a way that you have to look for evidence, right? That it's not like anybody says, and thanks to this young Black woman, we avoided white supremacist violence. It's that she prevented something that never happened, so it's hard to document something that didn't happen, um, but also that they weren't necessarily proclaiming her role or giving her credit, but the slow, there's a slow food movement. I think we also need to think about history sometimes as a slow history movement. You no, know, I want to know the stuff. I can be very impatient. But that, and again, the um, my deep appreciation for this fellowship, because getting to spend that much time in the archives, especially all at once, right? There are people who will go back to the National Archives for you know a week or two here and there, but which I will continue to do and have continued to do, but getting to spend months in the archive, you really get to pursue a lot of different directions. You get to sort of synthesize information in such a deep way. And that is a gift that this fellowship gives researchers. And what records are you in? Where are you researching? <laughs> um, right. So there are voluminous records, uh, like it, in any other archive, when you say record group and then you say number, it seems like a contained amount. And record group 391 or record group 393, which are both Civil War archives, um, are huge record groups. And often, I don't think I quite realized till I arrived at the National Archives, and I have done research in many other archives, including for this project, uh, including state archives, but only at the National Archives did I think, oh, I feel like American bureaucracy in some ways got invented during the Civil War <laughs> because the government had never undertaken anything on that scale. And they didn't know what scale it was going to be or how long it was going to last at the beginning. So there were no protocols for record keeping, right? So Sometimes the records get filed based on, you know, what military command it's under. And sometimes the records get filed based on where people are serving. And sometimes it's in the command records and sometimes it's in the daily troop records. So jumping around from one record group to another was much more a part of my life at the National Archives mm -hmm. than it has been at other archives. And again, that just keeping track of what you have and haven't looked at whenever you're in an archive, you feel time is such so precious because you know you can only be there for whatever amount of time. And so being able to really um, pursue leads across record groups was, was amazing. And um, what is your timing for being able to talk about the research, publishing the research? What's your next steps? Um, in some ways, again, like a slow food movement, trying not to rush it and the National Archives research was really research that reflects what was happening for my subject in her 20s. But now I'm going back and writing the earlier chapters of her childhood. Um, and she lives in three different places before the Civil War breaks out that are radically different places. 
So um, Richmond, Virginia, which is where she is born, probably where she's born, um, but certainly where she spent her early childhood. She then lived in a small town in the north, and then she lived in Liberia. So there's also a great deal of that to do. So oh my. I wish I could say this, um, my wonderful book will be on your nightstand for your bedtime reading soon, but um, part of due diligence is respecting, again, both the um, complicated facets of her life and also wanting to take the time to slow down and be like, wait, when she was eight years old, she was attending this church and this person was the minister and this is the, his history of black activism. And how was she learning from him about the way that you challenge racism, the way you figure out which white allies will be supportive of your work, um, who are the black women who become her role models in her life and where is she finding them and what were they doing? So um, I'm excited to share the story with the world, but I also wanna um, to really approach it not with a deadline orientation, but with a sort of, how can this help us understand race in the 19th century, primarily in America better? Do you have any advice for other future Koki fellows? Um, I do think if it's possible to try and take the time in the archives as much as you can in one big chunk, which can be hard depending on people's life commitments. I don't live anywhere near the National Archives. I live in <laughs> Oregon. I was primarily at the archives right in D.C., although I did also do some work at um, the College Park, Maryland facility. And I think just the rhythm of being in the archives is uh, is really helpful. Always be nice to the archive staff. I will say um, <laughs> there are great people who work at the National Archives and um, deep appreciation because sometimes you think you're hitting your head up against the wall and a nice archive staff person would be like, you know, I was just looking around. I know you're interested in this. And I think also because it does feel like the time is so precious the reading room itself is like a little seminar where all these people are doing research and some of their research will have nothing to do with yours. But the, because the staff knew that I was researching Black history, Civil War and Reconstruction, they would also be like, oh, uh, there was a point where somebody was researching a project and it had a question about one of the, one of the other researchers couldn't understand one of the words. It was a a term used to categorize black people, uh, you know, in the way we might know the terms mulatto and octoroon, which are dated and problematic terms. It was a term like that, but one that the researcher wasn't familiar with. So the person at the archive staff came over and said to me, Lois, can you help us with this? And I was like, oh yeah, this is what this means. And conversely, that happens the other way. I've been, I've been in the National Archives more than once and turned around to say, oh look, it's this other historian who I know, Holly, I didn't know you were gonna be here. Uh, Chris, it's so great to see you. And so thinking also not just about your own project, but sort of the community that you're in with both the staff and the other scholars there is fantastic. Well, Lois Levine, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us and good luck with everything. Thank you very much. And again, I really appreciate the support of the foundation and the Cookie Roberts Fellowship. It, I couldn't be doing this project without it. That's great to hear. And we are grateful to our donors and sponsors who support our outreach work like this virtual program. And if you want to support the Cookie Roberts Fellowship Fund and be a part of the National Archives Foundation, become a donor. Join us by visiting our website, archivesfoundation.org. If you enjoy museum gift stores and unique historic merchandise, be sure to visit nationalarchives.org, nationalarchivesstore.org to check out the terrific women's history and women's rights selection on our e-store. On behalf of the National Archives Foundation, thanks so much for joining us.